Hello everybody, um, thank you very much Danny and uh, a very big thanks to the Wellcome Trust for hosting us here tonight. Uh, my name is Tamsin, um, I was the founding director of Tender some 12 years ago, almost 13 years ago now. Um, I'm hoping that everybody in the room knows a little bit about Tender if they're here um, and if you don't, I'd like to say I think they're one of the most fabulous organisations doing amazing work with young people all over London and starting to do work with young people over the last two years all over the country as well. Tender is very much focused on health. They're focused on the health of um, women and men in their relationships um, and they do this through prevention programmes working with domestic and sexual violence. Um, we're very keen to promote healthy relationships, that's what we're really about. Um, and to alert young people to the dangers of abuse in relationships so that this can be avoided in the future. Um, when I set up Tender uh, 12, 13 years ago, I was working with a number of key women's organisations who were frontline service organisations for domestic and sexual abuse <coughs> charities. And many of these organisations were really keen that education work should be happening with young people in order to prevent domestic and sexual violence. And there were also other people around at the time who said, hmm, I don't think you can do that. I'm not sure that that's possible. Um, in particular, there were funders at that time who said, I think that money should still really be put into services in order to support people experiencing this rather than services that are aimed at prevention. I think what's really fantastic about what's happened over the last 10 years is how things have dramatically shifted and now funders are willing to put their funds into both services so that they're actually working with prevention and also supporting people who are fleeing violent relationships. Um, and there's been quite a significant shift, I think, in society in, in the 10 or 12 years in terms of how it looks at this issue. Um, you read more about it in the paper, you hear more about it on the news, there are more television programmes, um, people talk about it more, and there's still lots and lots of work. Uh, that needs to be done. So uh, with the title uh, this year of Tender's annual 2014 lecture being brave, I, I want you to think as you listen to the speakers about what you might take forward over the next year in terms of being brave with this issue. Um, what I'd like to do uh, to start with is to welcome our first speaker who is Hannah Lily Lanyon. Checked your first name, Hannah Lily, and didn't check your second name, sorry, um, to the stage. She's been working with Tender now for the last four years. She's on our youth board. Tender's youth board um, is a really important part of the work that we do because uh, without talking to young people and really getting an understanding of what they think we should be doing in our prevention programmes, we wouldn't be delivering the right kind of work. So Tender um, has been working with the Youth Board over the last eight years, I think, and Hannah Lilly has been an integral member. She presents events for such as Ten for Tender Anniversary. She also works at the Roundhouse as the presenter and producer of Strange Charm on the Roundhouse Radio. And mostly she spends her time studying for her A-levels, which she says are really hard. So I'd like you to welcome her to the stage, please. Daphne would say that like A levels is so much harder than this. So if you're like nervous that I'm nervous, no, I'm just nervous about passing my exams. Um, okay, hi, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm 18 years old, and I know my size might not give that away. I'd say I'm five foot two on a really, really good day. Like that, that's a day that's gone well for me. So I'm like yes, five foot two. Um, so I'd call myself an activist. Um, what is an activist? What does it mean for me? Being an activist means helping to achieve equality and justice in our society. Be that regarding race or gender or sexuality or disability. Activism comes in many forms. Sometimes it can be big. 
These little legs have walked miles in protest, chanting and screaming out against injustices, from austerity policy to victim blaming in rape cases, to the recent exposal of white police brutality in America. My favourite chant from these marches must be, this is what democracy looks like. Because it is, we live in an amazing country that allows us to congregate and march and protest our beliefs. They may not take any notice, but at least we're allowed to try. I do some other big things. Earlier this year, I helped Tender organise Tenfest. This is a festival in King's Cross, which you see Marie, she mainly organised it. I say I organised it, I didn't really organise it, I just did this thing and stand up. I like take credit, this is the great thing about Tender, I get to take credit for all this stuff because I stand at the front and say things. Um, so yeah, let's just say I organised Tenfest. Um, and that was showcasing spoken word and music and all the great things that Tender do, and then I take credit again, brilliant. Um, and that was all in the name of ending relationship abuse. I also run the Feminist Society at my school, and that can entail anything from speaking to the media on debates like the hijab to the mammoth task of trying to control a room of 50 plus angry teenage girls. And we get really angry after an hour of discussing the obstacles to gender equality, trust me. But activism also means small things. Activism can mean wearing your No More Page 3 t-shirt to work. Act yeah, I'm, I'm so happy you're here, like literally this has like, made my life. Um, yeah, that's Lucy Ann Holmes and the No More Page 3 team, and you should talk to them because they're like my idols. Um, oh yeah, another idol of mine is Stella Young, I don't know if anyone knows who she is, but she was this amazing disabled rights activist in Australia and she died this week, so if you don't know who she is, I would suggest you look at her TED talk, and it's better than this, so yeah, do it. Um, yeah, so you can be wearing your No More Page 3 t-shirt to work, or you can buy gender neutral toys when you're like looking for a friend's baby. I think one of the most annoying things is when you go to someone's house and they bought a little girl like a cooker. It's like, really? Is that really what you're looking for your for child? Um, and it can mean boycotting the sun. I would suggest that one. Start now. Um, so for me, like for months, my best friend has been organising a surprise birthday party for her boyfriend. And like, she is really scary. Like, I love her, but she can be really scary. And, like, she managed to organise all these people. And then a couple of weeks ago, I had to tell her that I couldn't come because I was going to reclaim the night. And that's a march that I went to in my feminist society. And confronting her and letting her down and telling that her that all this work that she put in, one of her best friends wasn't going to come, it might seem like a small thing, but it was actually the biggest challenge I faced. Like, not painting the banner or organising the group, not walking in the cold, just talking to a friend about what I was passionate about. So what I'm trying to say here is there are loads and endless, endless opportunities to be active, to be brave. So perhaps your friend wasn't as supportive as my friend was, like, she just said, yeah, that's great, I really believe in what you're doing, and that was such a weight off my shoulders, but your friends might not be like that. They might think that, you know, the objectification of women, or the discrimination against disabled workers, or the increasing suicide rate, just, they're not, they don't understand why you're interested, they just think it's none of their business. Of course, like, my first reaction here is to question why are you friends with these people? <laughs> but, you know, I'm sure you have your reasons. No, I'm sure you do, I'm sure you do. Like, they could be really good at cuddling, or they could like the same films that you do, and they could stand out in the cold with you, even though they, like, all evening, even though they haven't brought a scarf and they haven't smoked in ages, but they stand with you anyway. And, you know, I'm sure you have good friends. <laughs> but, you can so you can forgive them for not being as passionate as you are about the media's <coughs> blindness to female, sex uh, to female objectification and like f sporting endeavours, for example. But their aversion to social justice might actually work to your advantage because you have a captive audience to be brave. So you've all come this evening, I've got you, you're here, you can't leave. I will see you if you leave. But your friends, you know, they're there every day and you can talk to them. And you can stand up and persuade them of your views. If everybody managed to persuade just one person that it's wrong to buy non-fair trade produce, I'm pretty sure that fair trade would be a reality very soon. It just takes one small action. Just one conversation. And you've already made a small step. Like I said, you're here. By coming here on this cold December night when it would have been so much easier to just stay at home with hot chocolate and EastEnders, you have been active. I, mean, I didn't even really want to come tonight. I'm speaking. I was just like, I want to go home and sit in my pyjamas, but... We did it, we all got here, and yeah, I, didn't even, I went into the wrong building. I don't know if anyone else did this, but I went into the Welcome Collection, and they were like, 10 lecturers and on. I was like, oh my god, I'm losing it. Um, but you're here, you've done it, and that's just great. That's really, really amazing. You've made a move to support the end of teenage relationship abuse. And like Tamsin was saying, teenage relationship abuse, it might not seem like a big issue. It might be one of those things you think, oh, they'll just grow out of it. 
but unfortunately people who abuse people in their teens, it carries on. And so if we can stop teenage relationship abuse, we're really stopping it at the stem of the issue. So it's great, you're here. Why not keep going? Maybe you're not ready to have that conversation with your friends about the problems presented by porn. Maybe you're not ready to march along Whitehall in full view of London, chanting and shouting. Maybe you simply can't. Maybe you're disabled or suffering from a debilitating illness. But the modern world presents so many tools for us to stand up and be active. Even if we literally can't do it, sign a petition. Do it. You know, there's like change and avars and 38 degrees and all out. Just that's listing a few out of many. I mean, even the government has a petition website, so they're basically encouraging you to disagree with them, which is mind-blowing. But do it. Do it. You've got that opportunity. Um, or you could like share some news stories on Facebook. That's what I do most of the time. Like this week, I think I've shared, I was counting them up, I think I've shared eight, which must be really annoying for people. But I've shared stories about white supremacy in Britain. Um, I've also shared stories about like these people called the Mirabelle sisters and they stood up against domestic abuse in the Dominican Republic. And it's so inspiring. And if you can share that with your friends and it'll pop up on their newsfeed and they might not have even thought of this before. And that's, a, I, for me, I think that's an amazing way of being active. So the world is at our fingertips, and I think we should change it. So this is why I've been banging on about being small. I don't actually have a complex. I don't find it particularly problematic being pocket size. But I've been stressing it because I want to remind you that we all think we're small. We all think we're just a little drop in the ocean, a little five foot girl in a sea of six foot men. God, happens a lot. But that shouldn't be a barrier. Let's embrace our smallness. Let's embrace the fact that we are all just one person. But let's not think of ourselves as just one person, or only one person. We are one person can make a huge difference. So just start, any way, anywhere, anyhow. Just start being brave. Thank you. It's pretty inspiring stuff, isn't it? Honestly, it's fantastic. Hannah, thank you very much. Um, I'd like now to move on quickly to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Keir Starmer was the Director of Public Project prosecutions and head of the Crown Prosecution Service from 2008 to 2013. He's well known for his work as a human rights barrister and was named QC of the Year in the field of human rights and public law in 2007 by Chambers and Partners Director. In 2005 he won Bar Council Sydney Elland Goldsmith Award for his outstanding contribution to pro bono work, pro bono work in the challenging and challenging work of the death penalty throughout the Caribbean and Asia and Africa. Um, <coughs> Kia, thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, it's my great privilege to introduce Claire for the lecture um, this evening. Um, as some of you may know, I um, delivered the lecture for tender in 2012, two years ago, when we were celebrating uh, 10 years of existence of tenure, uh, of tender and everything that uh, tender has stood for uh, and achieved and it was a really good event. Um, I took the opportunity then to highlight what I saw as a really pressing concern. I was Director of Public Prosecutions at the time. We were in the middle of trying to think through how we improve the criminal justice response to sexual violence, <coughs> personal violence, violence within relationships and particularly domestic violence. Um, and everybody knows that the figures for domestic violence are shocking. I, I don't think I've ever spoken at any conference, even amongst people who know exactly what they're talking about. And when you just go through the figures for domestic violence, people uh, are shocked by what they hear. And they're stuck. They're stuck for a very long time. But one of the things when I was DPP that really troubled me was that there were emerging research studies showing that those most at risk of what we had thought to be domestic violence, we'd characterise domestic violence, violence within relationships, etc., um, were not people in their 20s or their 30s or their 40s or their 50s, but actually girls between the ages of 16 to 19. That this was a real um, continuing problem. We hadn't really thought about this domestic violence because we thought about that as sort of a, a different, more permanent kind of relationship. But that research is there, it's growing. And I remember reading it and thinking, not only are we in the foothills with dealing with domestic violence generally, in the wings we've got another generation who are being subjected to the same sort of abuse. And it just made the whole thing so much more uh, profound. Um, and that's why Tender's work is so important. Because actually it's focusing 
um, on that sort of abuse. Um, and it's focusing on it in the right way, with the right people. Using people of the right age to spread the message, not people like me. And that is serious. If you really want to change attitudes, you don't change attitudes by getting an ex-DPP to say things. You get attitudes by get, you change things by getting people in the right age group, mixing with the right people, speaking. And that's why what Tinder is doing is really, really important. I was really struck by it when I spoke two years uh, ago. I mean, the work on education and prevention, engaging young people in the debate, empowering them, speaking the way Hannah does. I mean, you know, that is far more powerful than anything the rest of us could do. And it's really important for two reasons. First is because there are going to be victims there and they need to hear what is being said. They need to understand what is happening to them, know what to do about it. And that's really important. It's also important for everybody else who may not be being abused. One of the great problems we've got in our society is that people make assumptions about what victims of abuse are like and how they're going to respond to what's happening to them. We make it for all age groups. So for years we've assumed, certainly in the criminal justice field, that if you're abused you would tell someone straight away. You'd be able to articulate what had happened to you. You'd put things in chronological order. None of that's true. And through tender, we can reach out to the victims, we can reach out to everybody else. Um, and that's why I particularly wanted to be here um, this evening. And I'm even more pleased to be able to introduce Claire to give the main lecture. Uh, Claire has been, I mean, you'll see the biography there, but it doesn't do justice to Claire's work. She's been a stalwart in the campaign against sexual abuse and exploitation for a very long time, and before many others were involved in it. She's the perfect person to be giving the lecture tonight on Being Brave, the inaugural lecture of Tender. Uh, as you'll know, Claire was an MP for Lady Well from 1983 to 2010 and held both shadow cabinet positions and cabinet positions. She has worked literally at the highest levels in our country and internationally. But, and this is the important bit, she has never compromised her independence of thought or her independence of word. And that takes bravery. She stood out on the really big, important issues, including the Iraq war. And she spoke out early and often about sexual exploitation. She campaigned against page three a long time ago and for many, many years. And she battled the dinosaurs in parliament who made her life hell for doing so in those stages. I first met Claire when we were working together as part of an independent inquiry into the activities of the notorious West Midlands Serious Crime Squad. And it gives me really great pleasure to be here this evening for this lecture uh, and to hand over the baton, if you like, um, to Claire. And I'll do that in just one moment. Before I do, will you excuse me for slipping quietly out? I'm in the middle of a selection exercise um, with the Labour Party to become the candidate for Hoban and St Pancras and we're in the last few days. I had marked my diary no events for this week or last week and I've refused everything apart from this but I really wanted to come along to this to be here with you so if you'll excuse me I'll introduce Claire um, and I'll quietly slip away but I'm very pleased to be here to be supporting the work of Tender. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Keir, and I don't know if it's right if we wish you well, but it's, it, it, Herbert and St Pancras includes this area where we are, so if, if all goes well, he'll be the MP for your premises in the future. <laughs> um, I'm very pleased to be here with you this evening and to support your very important work. I'm Pleased to speak after Hannah, who I think was more confident than her nervous mother sitting next to her. Congratulations on having such a, a brilliant and bright young daughter. I'm sure you helped to create her in every sense of that concept. Um, when I was asked to do this lecture, I obviously had to say yes, because the work that Tender does is so fantastically important. But getting near the other day, when I asked Susie what she wanted me to talk about, about being brave, I mean, it could be the Iraq war, but you wouldn't quite be that audience, I think, or you probably do care about it, but you know that. Um, she said it was the campaign against page three and all it led to. Um, and I'd be happy to do that. 
Well, I want to make a few preliminary remarks, if I may. When I was a child, a sort of ten-year-old or so, nearly 50 years ago in Hansworth in Birmingham, no one took any action whatsoever about domestic violence. People used to say, oh, he beats her, you know, and people would turn away and flinch. The police never responded. No one ever uh, contacted the police. Women largely got, got married young in those days and had children very quickly. And once they had children, very rarely had any independent income. Family allowance wasn't paid to the woman then. Um, there was nowhere to go, nowhere to escape to. And what I want to say is, although this is a most distressing subject, you know, two women every week die as a result of violence from their partner or ex-partner, it's unbearable. Actually, it's better than it used to be. And that's a consequence of lots and lots of people being brave. Lots of women who against enormous odds were brave enough to say I'm not putting up with this and aunties and grannies and so on who took them in when you weren't supposed to do that kind of thing and it brought shame on the whole family um, those feminists in the 70s and so on who, who, who built the the movement to have places of relief where women could run to. That was a movement that came from outside the system, outside local government, <coughs> outside building safe havens to say you can escape, you can be protected, you can make yourself safe. And I just want to say being brave isn't just individuals that people think that's a brave person. It's accretions of brave people who make a bit of a stand and move things forward and that's how big history is made and I want to say all that because when we think about these issues it's, it's fundamentally depressing and you can think what is wrong with humanity what is going on why can't we stop this but actually things are changing and it's less bad than it used to be and it's not normal anymore to think you just have to put up with it um, and of course this younger generation are the big change agents of probably putting it into the dustbin of history so the normality of it will simply cease to be as the work of organisations like Tender doesn't just care for those who've been hurt, which we must do, but says to young people, never put up with this. It's not right in any way whatsoever. So there's been lots of people who've been very brave and there's been a lot of change and a lot of progress, but that doesn't mean we've done it. There's a lot more to do, um, but progress, there has been more progress, there will be. Um, on the page three thing, I really got into it by accident. Um, I went to the House of Commons in 1983. There are racks of newspapers in all sorts of rooms around the place, and when you walk into the public eye, you suddenly get attacked, usually attacked by the media. I remember very early on I said a really shocking thing that the people who'd been convicted of the Birmingham pub bombings, which were truly dreadful bombings in a pub in the middle of Birmingham and lots of people were killed, but they were probably got the wrong people and you just get absolutely smashed for that. Of course, it's a matter of public record now, that, but they come at you, you know how it is. I don't want to discourage you from going into public life, but when it first <laughs> hits you, it's a bit tough. So you start looking at these papers when they're having a go at you and I was just struck by how many of them had these take me, use me, throw me away, sexualised images of, of um, nearly naked women. And I hadn't, I mean, I knew the phenomenon existed, but I hadn't looked at those kind of papers very much in my life. And it's very shocking when you see how many of them there are, and they just hit you like that. So that's in the back of my mind, thinking this is a very ugly thing, why do we have it? You know, I'm that generation of post-Second World War children who got the free orange juice and girls who had more education than ever before. And we had full employment, by the way, and, um, you know, lots of improved chances for, for women's education. So it's shocking when you face it. It's ugly and nasty and backward. Um, but that was just in the back of my head. And then one Friday, there was private members' business, and you have to 
if you want to stop a bill, and I, I and Joe Richardson and lovely people like that were trying to stop a bill brought in by Enoch Powell that was to prevent any research on embryos at the very earliest, when they're no bigger than a full stop, that would prevent all sorts of problems of infertility. You would think, but no, they wanted to stop that research. So we were very keen to prevent Enoch Powell having his success with that bill. And therefore, what you have to do is keep the discussion on the previous bill going. And the previous bill was Winston Churchill's grandson, um, a man of less stature, if I may put it like that, uh, <laughs> than his grandfather. Of course, his grandfather, who was wrong about most things, but right about one big thing. <laughs> and therefore, the country was brilliant, honoured him as a war leader and got rid of him for the peace. But that's another uh, conversation. Um, but he'd been found, I don't know if you remember, I think he's died recently, has he? Um, going down the motorway with Mrs. Khashoggi, and she, if he went faster, she got rid of some pieces of clothing. I don't know if you remember that story, but I think he was doing penance for that. And he was bringing in a private member's bill anyway, that would make all sorts of images of violence and, and sexual behavior illegal. And it was a most foolish bill. Um, it would have outlawed most war reporting, um, sex education materials. It was so crudely drawn. We, are any of you old enough to remember the picture of the little girl in Vietnam running down the road who'd been in a palm? That would have become an illegal image. Um, pictures of, that are used for sex education would have become illegal, ridiculous. So I was sitting there and I had no planned speech and as this went on and some people denounced it as a very foolish bit, bit proposal and then some people supporting the bill said women across Britain are very angry about sexual violence and they won't forgive us if we don't support this bill. And that kind of got me riled up and I got up and said this is extremely foolish and for the reasons I've just described. Um, and in fact, it's true that women are angry about sexual violence and being degraded um, as sexual objects. Uh, but if we really want to do something, why don't we bring in some tightly drawn legislation to just carve out these images in the mainstream of the press that are pouring out into young minds endlessly, day after day, week after week, on buses and kitchen tables and so on, and as I was talking, I said, in fact, I think I'll introduce my own bill. All unplanned and unrehearsed. <laughs> and then, um, the, 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 you know, where the, the press are in the press gallery, there weren't many people, but there must have been some reporting, because then I got a few hundred letters from women saying, please do it, please, please, please do. And the most interesting thing about this is less what I did than this phenomenal response that came from women. Um, so then I thought, OK, I'll do this, and I went through the procedures to get permission to bring in the bill. Um, and I was always very clear, we draw very tightly, for applying to the press only, I mean, there are other problems about pornography, but in terms of any argument about censorship, if you draw very tightly um, the requirement that no such images should be in the press, I don't think anyone can say you're censoring anything that's of any value or preciousness to, to society. Um, so I brought, I brought in this bill, and the House of Commons behaved outrageously. In those days, there were less women in politics. And whenever you said cervical cancer, they'd giggle. They, they wouldn't dare now, whatever they do in their private clubs uh, later on. Um, so any mention of breasts, and they're all giggling and screaming and making remarks about me, and so on. Outrageous behaviour. Um, it's another measure that things have improved. They wouldn't dare to behave like that now. Partly um, televis televising of Parliament, partly there's more women there. It's another measure of progress, you know, I in a way. Um, just as the kind of crude racism that was around when I was a young girl. My father used to point out those cards saying, no Irish, no colours. Room, room to rent, no Irish, no colours. My, my dad was Irish. But, no, of course, that's illegal now, but no one would dare, and most people wouldn't even think of it. So although I'm, I really want everyone to be focused on what we've got to do, I do want us to feel hopeful about what's been achieved and that we can do it, and not get depressed by these questions. But anyway, outrageous, horrible behaviour, and then after that, the sun went for me. 20 things you ought to know about Crazy Claire, uh, get a bumper sticker to denounce Crazy Claire, da, 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 on and on, all the ugliest photos they could find of me. Uh, she's only jealous, screwed up about sex, oh, oh. You, you think, what is the problem? 
but he's not very nice, I have to say. I mean, yes, by then I'm having to be brave to keep standing up and taking it, but you know, in life, once you've started something, it's easier to be brave, because you either give in or keep going, and you have to keep going, don't you? Otherwise they've won and that would be terrible. Um, <laughs> so, but then what happened was that I got floods of letters, the first lot being from women saying, are you okay? We're so sorry they behave so badly. We really like you. Come and see me. Do you want a cup of tea? Here's a picture of my daughter. <laughs> no, but beautiful. You know, out of just... And the media weren't particularly sympathetic, but somehow they picked up on it and they were trying to protect me, which was very lovely and very interesting. And, of course, this was before email, so these are all letters. People have written it down and put a stamp on and posted it. And then on it went, and then more and more letters came in moving and distressing letters, thousands and thousands, probably as many as 10,000. Um, women who'd been sexually abused as children, saying pornography was used in the process and every time they see it, it brought it all back to them. Farage was at it the other week, told to stop and get out and that it was disgusting so that you're in a society littered with images of breasts, but it's indecent to feed a baby and use the breast for what it exists for. Um, in our basic biology and all, and all animals. Um, women, quite a few women, who were in therapy and had been sent to psychiatrists because there was supposed to be something wrong with them because they didn't like pornography. Shocking. In, in treatment, you know, husband brings it in, says, don't you like this? No, she says, something wrong with you, my dear, screwed up, blah, blah. Off you go to the psychiatrist. Quite a lot of those letters. So there was this enormous outpouring of people telling their own personal stories, uh, saying we agree, uh, there's something objectionable. And I would say, although it went on that um, some pap papers dropped it, the mirror and so on, and the sun belligerently kept selling it, um, some great liberation happened in that lots and lots of women who thought it was just them suddenly found that most women hate this stuff. And so even if it's not gone, that's liberating. That gives you dignity. That makes you feel, I'm, I'm, I'm normal and it's healthy that I don't like this ugly stuff. So that's really the story. What did it achieve? I think it's a, there's a positive and a negative. I think the positive is that liberation of, so, and I should add to all the lovely men here, at some point, the Guardian or someone talked to me about all these letters. People saw me coming out of the post office with my big bags of mail. And I said that it was all these women writing. And I said, there haven't been really any letters from men. And then I got a flood of letters from men saying, I'm so sorry I didn't write. <laughs> I agree. You know, so there are good men out there. And we, no doubt you're here. Um, and we must remember that. There's some men who've got problems, but there's a lot of good men who also want the change to dignity and equality and mutual respect and it's in those circumstances the best sexual relationships take place when it's violence and... no it is there's no question and I, i'm old enough to be able to inform you all of this. Uh, um, so if you want to be happy and enjoy really beautiful sex you've got to have equality and dignity and mutual respect because it's true so that ugly version that they say is about sex, it isn't. It's about domination and um, belittling. Um, so things have been achieved, but I would say since those times, there's a, the proliferation of pornography is greater. So this is a sort of achievements and bad things. It's partly the internet, and, you know, is it 40% of all the material on the internet is pornography, which is really very depressing. Um, and also, I don't know, I've just bumped into things on the radio or things I've read about sex education amongst young people and lots of young men get their first ideas of sex from pornography and expect their young girlfriends to act out those... Po I mean, this is a tragedy. Um, and it's part of the consequence of this ugliness. And also... This is a few years ago, but I remember reading it, a study of young people's first sexual experiences. 
And the one that sticks in my mind of a, it was a young woman who said, well, I was drunk and it was in a toilet. And my dream is to make love to someone who loves me in a bed. So I think we're making progress, but we've got a lot further to go. Certainly the Department for International Development now has programs right across the world. This is a problem across the world in all ethnicities, in all cultures. I'm certain of it that men who are violent to their partners are the men who are less secure in themselves. So we can't only do it with young women. Young men have got to start feeling comfortable with themselves and about their sexuality in order for there to be relationships that have dignity and equality and mutual respect in them. And I'm sure that Tender works both with young women and young men to that. Uh, to that end. So, I think it's better to be brave because if you're not, you're going to be kind of ashamed for the rest of your life that you didn't make the stand in those moments that you should. I think it's better to be brave because you can have more dignity in your own life and indeed better sex. <laughs> 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 um, sorry, I didn't mean to make that a theme. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, in politics, life can be very tough, but I think if you try to do what's right, you won't always get it perfect, but you're going to feel better about yourself, your family, your kids, what you've got to say about yourself. And this battle, it's like the battle against slavery, against racism, against you know, misuse of servants. There used to be, until the First World War, every middle class home in Britain had servants. There was lots of violence. There's something ugly in people when they can dominate others. And there's something beautiful in people when they learn to respect themselves and other people. And that's what this is for. And we are making progress, but we could do much better. Thank you very much. Well, I'm sure I say on behalf of everybody, thank you very much. Inspiring to hear your words. And um, inspiring to hear how you stood up and, and coped with the rubbish that was thrown at you um, and we still see it happening now we still see the press attacking people um, and we will still go on being brave thank you um we have some bravery uh, bravery awards to make and we're very excited that um, olivia coleman is joining us this evening to hand these awards out olivia is a bafta winning actress after award-winning actress. I'm having a terrible time reading this. <laughs> I'm really making a hash of it. I've got a cold, that's my excuse, if, in case anybody wants to know whether I can't actually read or not. Um, so Olivia is known for a multitude of roles, and I'm not going to go through them. They're in the programme, but I would love to invite you to the stage to um, hand these awards out. Thank you. is making some award, bravery awards to a number of winners who have built communities free from abuse and they're bravely challenging practices and behaviours that condone or encourage unhealthy relationships. The first award goes to Child Hills, Child's Hill Primary School. This is the first primary school in the country to receive our London Council's Violence Prevention Programme. It is brave for a primary school to invite an, an organisation in and do violence prevention work with young people around this issue. Please let me tell you, I remember 10 years ago going to a primary school and them saying, there isn't any domestic violence in this school. It doesn't happen. So, um, during the two-day project, 22 Year 6 students participated in domestic and sexual abuse prevention workshops that focused on good and bad friendships, conflict resolution, safe and unsafe touch, rights of the child and support. And on the second day, they looked at forced marriage. Um, at the end of the project, the students presented what they had learned to another 111 students. So can I welcome Charles Hill Primary School to have their awards? The second award goes to Kalea Bax. Kalea was one of Tender's first youth board members. She joined the board in 2011 and is one of our most active campaigners. 
She approached her school to set up two separate fundraisers for the organisation in 2013 and through her initiative the school successfully raised over a thousand pounds. Um, Calais has encouraged other young people to join our board and become an active campaigner for equality, respect and violence-free relationships. Come on up, Calais. <laughs> Um, Azania Hammondallis is our third uh, winner and she is one of the first young people to complete our OCN Level 2 in Peer Mentoring and Facilitation. So this trains her up specifically to be a fabulous trainer in domestic pre uh, violence prevention and working with teenage relationship violence. She demonstrated remarkable skills for motivating and supporting her peers and in November she planned and delivered a healthy relationships project to young people in Primrose Hill Primary School. We hope this, this will be one of many more fabulous projects you deliver. Thank you. <laughs> Lucy Ann Holmes is the powerful campaigner who founded No More Page 3 campaign. This is the recent No More Page 3 campaign. <laughs> Um, and has been the driving force behind its success. Most recently, Tesco has a re a re agreed to change the way it displays the sun in response to two years of dedicated campaigning by No More Page 3. They are a team to be reckoned with, Lucianne and her team, and they are a particularly strong voice on social media, encouraging the message to reach far and wide. Thank you very much, Lucianne. Award, not uh, last but not least, Newham Youth Offending Team. Since 2012, we have delivered seven healthy relationships projects for Newham Youth Offending Team. During each project, we've worked with young people to identify what makes a relationship healthy or unhealthy, to look at the early warning signs of abuse, because you can tell if somebody is likely to use abuse later in the relationship. There are signs, and this is a key thing we work with young people on. To explore the kind of excuses perpetrators give and understand the reasons why people stay in abusive relationships. And look also at where people can access support. Over the past two years, we've worked with 70 young people through new um, youth offending team and they have shown exceptional dedication in supporting their young people on the subject. Thank you. So I would just like to invite Olivia to say a few words as our new patron. Very short. That's, that's it. <laughs> um, what's been brilliant listening to Claire and everybody else who's spoken and finding out about these um, award winners is how bravery by just a few can change a whole landscape. Meaning, those who are less brave can become involved until no bravery is required at all. That's what all of you are helping to create a society where it is not brave to speak out against abuse, it is normal. It is just what we do. Thank you very much. So we're coming to the end now. Um, I'm going to invite Susie to come and uh, give some closing words. But before I do, you will find a tender bag on your chair. And inside it are some presents from Zoeva, who on hearing about tender and the lecture wanted to give a little something to thank you. So Eva Cosmetics have been featured in this month's L Health and Fitness and numerous other publications. There are some other goodies in there as well that you, you can find. So we're really delighted to have their support and I really encourage you to snap some pictures of yourself with the gifts that we've got in there and tweet them with the hashtag being brave. So I'd really encourage you to do that this evening just to let people know what we've been doing. Um, I'd like to introduce Susie McDonald, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Tender. Susie and I met several years ago, 15 years ago, I think. I won't tell the bad story, Susie. Um, working for the National Theatre, and uh, we were involved in a number of projects together. 
And I then went off and um, was working with the events and the vagina monologues. And Susie was delivering work in Essex for Zero Tolerance Trust, who at the time were possibly the only organisation at that time delivering prevention work in this area of domestic and sexual violence. Once I had established the company, I went to speak to Susie about whether she would come and work with me. And she has essentially taken tender and turned it into the most fantastic organisation. We've worked with over seven, 70, 700 schools, um, and I think <coughs> 18,000 young people in that time or something like that. So please welcome to the stage Susie McDonald. Um, I haven't prepared anything to say because I knew that the words of those people coming before me this evening would be enough. Um, I think there might be members of my team waiting for me to burst into tears uh, because whenever I say that I'm proud of the work that we're doing, usually it does reduce me to tears, but I'm going to attempt not to do that this evening. And probably the pain in my feet from my new shoes will, will prevent that happening. Um, so it really just gives me great pleasure in saying thank you to Claire, to Hannah, to Olivia and to Kia uh, for making this evening extraordinary. I knew it would be and I didn't need to be nervous about anything to do with it. I knew it would be a wonderful event. Um, Danny, thank you so much for giving this beautiful venue to us free of charge and it's just taking the pressure off us for making this an amazing event. Um, I think what I would like you to remember, which are the, is a key theme, I think, through this evening, is that we're, we're part of a group and we are not individuals and we can go forward and change the world. And when my girls sometimes say to me, oh, help me with my homework or, oh, you're a bit late, where are you going now? Then I say, I'm going off and I'm changing the world. And they will remember that when they're 35. <laughs> Don't necessarily remember it now. Um, but I would like to draw your attention as we finish to this lion, our lion heart, which is the emblem of tonight's event. Um, it was created by a very lovely young woman who is 13. Her name is Daisy. Uh, she's not able to be here tonight. Um, but I think it sums up everything that we're trying to do. It's brave and it's proud and it's strong but it's very kind as well and it, it keeps at the heart of us uh, so when you're out there fighting your corner uh, remember that heart that lion it's with all of us it's beating with all of us and 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 let's fight this fight together but don't worry if you mess up because sometimes if you're trying to fight your corner it doesn't always work and finding the right language and articulating it in that moment doesn't always work because we've spent centuries with a certain uh, common denominator of, of how things are. So it will take a long time but practice it, practice it with friends and then practice it out in the, the big wide world and it's worth it because I completely agree that we can feel a respect for ourselves with what we're trying to achieve and that's brilliant. So thank you for coming. Tonight.